Uh, can I have everyone's attention, please? It, it's, uh, it's just past 7.15, so I wanted to get started. Uh, Todd asked me to fill, on, fill in on his behalf uh, this morning to give the Surgeon-in-Chief report and to introduce Chris Ahmad, who's our guest speaker uh, for this morning. So the um, Surgeon-in-Chief report today is going to be dedicated to the uh, passing of Philip D. Wilson, Jr. on Ju uh, June 29, 2016. Um, I, I feel, and Todd asked us to all take a moment to remember this great man and the impact he has had on the hospital and use his memory as an inspiration for what we can accomplish and what we can, get, we can pass on to those that we teach here at the Hospital for Special Surgery. So he put a few slides together just on, on uh, Dr. Wilson. Dr. Wilson became the Surgeon Chief at the hospital uh, in 1972, the same year that he became President of the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgery. At that time, in 1972, there were approximately 24 in staff, uh, some outpatient, some inpatient, and four operating rooms. He was responsible for the transform transformation of the hospital from an institution with great local recognition to one of international acclaim. Uh, during his, uh, by, by the end of his, uh, or, I'm sorry, during his 17-year tenure, he developed a significant research program, uh, the biomechanics division, and the birth of many innovations, including innovative total knee arthroplasty that dominated the world. He invoked the super specialization within orthopedics and innovated the residency program, growing it, to signific growing it significantly and creating linked rotations for the residents with interconnectivity in their training as well as daily lectures and teaching. During his two dec decades in Surgeon-in-Chief, he graduated 146 residents and 181 fellows. He was thought of as a role model for his trainees uh, uh, and because they envisioned in him the attributes of leadership, precision, vision, humor, dedication, and compassion that they would want for themselves. At the end of his tenure in Surgeon-in-Chief, there were eight ORs, 192 beds, with an average length of, length of stay of eight days. The hospital revenue was $100 million with 25 orthopedic surgeons, 19 rheumatologists, and 13 anesthesiologists. In testimony to his love for the institution, he continued to be a presence at HSS well after his tenure as Surgeon-in-Chief was completed. As recently as two months ago, he was president at Medical Staff Conference and con continued to be a presence whether in the room or through the tenets he had set forth at HSS. For all the patient he has, patients he has touched, the residents and fellows he has taught, and the attending staff he has led both by example and directly, Philip Wilson, Jr. will serve as an inspiration for the generations to come. And let's honor uh, him by emulating those qualities in him and con continuing to make our institution great. So uh, we'll take a moment for Dr. Wilson. So uh, this morning, we have the pleasure of uh, having Dr. Chris Ahmad, Professor of Orthopedic Surgery at Columbia University Medical Center, Chief of Sports Medicine, Head Team Physician for the New York Yankees, Head Team Physician for the New York City Football Club, and Vice Chair of Clinical Research. Uh, Chris has accomplished uh, uh, a million things in his academic career, uh, both with research and education. Uh, and uh, it's a pleasure to introduce him today. He's uh, speaking on the principles that surgeons, athletes, and other elite performers used to achieve mastery. Thanks a lot, Chris. Well, I couldn't be more humbled to be here. This is probably the highest concentration of surgical skill in the country sitting in this room right now. So it's really a privilege to talk to you about a topic that I really have a lot of passion about. And the reason why this topic became something of interest to me is because I've had the privilege, like many of you, of interacting with elite athletes, taking care of them. I've also had interactions with musicians of the highest level, and it became clear to me that all of these people in talented worlds, whether it's chess, music, or sports, they use the same principles that we use as surgeons to get to the highest level. So I'm going to share with you some of these principles. And I think we would all agree, being good or even great at something, whatever it is, parenting, cooking, or surgery, is probably one of the deepest and most fulfilling things that we experience. So skill is the ability to do something that comes from training. You work at it and you get good at it. Mastery 
is having a real deep, profound knowledge that goes along with skill that real, really allows you to be even better at it. And for us, when we think of people who have excelled and got to the highest level, like the people in this room, it's very daunting. Sometimes we feel like we can't get there. There's these so-called gifted surgeons. I'm gonna to talk to you about the so-called gifted athletes and others that really have made it to that level through a process and not through natural ability. So this is Earl Woods, and he's a teacher of military tactics. He played high-level sports in college. He was on his second marriage when they had Tiger, and he was retired, and he was dedicated to the training of Tiger Woods. So at age seven months, Tiger has a putter in his hand, and by age two years, he's practicing on the golf course. So in four, at age four, he has professional instruction. And by age 19, he's already had 17 years of high-level instruction. And for many of us, I'm in my 15th year of practice, he's already had more training at the age of 19 than I've had in my professional practice. This is an interesting story about chess players, Holger sisters. There's a gentleman, his name is Laszlo Polger, and he's a chess coach and a psychologist. And he has this theory and belief that he can train and create the best chess players in the world. And he wants to do this experiment. In order to do it, he needs some offspring. He's having a hard time getting some offspring, so he actually advertises an experiment in the media and says, I'd like to have offspring with somebody to run this experiment, and he gets a taker. They produce three children. Out of those three, Judith and Sophia become the number one and number two chess player in the world. In fact, Judith beats um, Bobby Fischer as the earliest grandmaster at age 15. This is a facility. We often think it's got to be about equipment or it's got to be the environment, which it probably is, but it's not so much about technology. This is a facility outside of Moscow. It has two tennis courts. These two tennis courts produce more top 20 female world rank tennis players than the entire United States. There's something about the environment. And this is Matthew Syed, who's a tremendous table tennis player. In his community, 50% of the top table tennis players came from the same street. So I look at this sign walking through the academy meeting at the exhibit hall, and you can read it, orthopedic surgeon, split second decisions takes years of experience. And this concept of 10,000 hours has become very popular. Everybody's heard about 10,000 hours. This is what 10,000 hours really is. It's about four hours a day for 10 years. You can break it down, 20 hours, 50 weeks. And, but really, this didn't come from Malcolm Gladwell, who popularized this. This came from a social psych, uh, psychologist, Anders Ericsson. He retrospectively reviewed the best violinists and compared them to weaker violinists, and he found out that the best ones happened to average 10,000 hours, and the weakest one averaged much less. So this became popular. If you're gonna be good at surgery, you're gonna be good at sales, or you're gonna be good at anything, you just need 10,000 hours. In fact, that was Malcolm Gladwell who said that, but Anders Ericsson just came out with a great book called Peak, and he said, it's not really the 10,000 hour rule that we talk about so frequently now. I'm gonna explain it in some various different methods on how it's not simply 10,000 hours. So my son happens to be here, and he is very interested in chess. He goes to a school that has a big emphasis on chess. This is the Scholastic New York City Tournament. Big ballroom at one of the hotels, chess games going on at every table. This is him playing. I dropped him off. You're not allowed to go in the room. You can't watch. You got to wait outside with all the other parents. They go in, they play a game, they come out, and if they win, they continue to play. Here's the thing about chess at this level. Every move that they make, both the player and the opponent, have to write down every move and record it. E4, E5, knight F3, knight F6, bishop C4, that kind of stuff. So the reason is, afterwards, to get better, you meet with your chess coach and you go over every move. And every move is analyzed as either a great move, acceptable move, or a blunder. You put yourself in a position of losing something like your queen. And this relates to medical training. So medical training resembles this. We have residents who meet patients, do physical exams, we observe them, and then they come and present to us, and then we critique them on whether it was a good move, a good exam, a good diagnosis, or not. So it's this constant move by move. 
It's Friday morning, I'm with you. Usually Friday morning at 6.30, I'm doing what we call a surgical techniques conference for our residents and our fellows. And each week, one of our fellows or residents presents a case step by step and goes through it, and we stop them at every point and tell them if it was a good move or a blunder. I'll give you an example. This is a case being presented to us. It's a distal biceps repair. This is the exposure. You say, wait a minute. This exposure is not so good here. What's a better way to get exposure? What's a better move? And the fellows say, well, I'm going to put a retractor in. Retractors help with exposure. What kind of retractor? Where are you going to put it? Well, I'm going to put a homin in, a levering retractor. Where are you going to put it? I'm going to put it on the radial neck. Really get that thing exposed. Well, which side of the radial neck? I'll put it on the radial side. We would call that a blunder because the PIN is on the radial side of the radial neck, and PIN palsies after this operation are extremely common. So in this conference, we taught everybody how to avoid that blunder, and it's extremely powerful. It's not why did you do that, it's what would you do with if the exposure is poor, if the portal's off, if the graph doesn't look good. So this has been well studied. This is an educational principle. It's called counterfactual simulation, and it's powerful and it's really hard because you really have to think about it to generate some of these thoughts on how to get through it. This is Magnus Carlson. He's hanging out at the Marshall Chess Club. This is in uh, the West Village. It's one of the most famous chess clubs in all of the world. Washington Square Park right next to it. It's a photo I took. These guys playing chess over here. I had to take a step back because this guy said, 10 bucks if you're going to take my picture. So Magnus Carlson is the number one chess player in the world. And I got to visit the Marshall Chess Club with a grandmaster. He took me there. He wanted to show me what chess world is like. There's only 50 grandmasters in the entire United States. And it became a question of whether these elite grandmaster chess players have these amazing IQs and amazing intellectual capacities. Can they project more than anybody else? And in fact, the answer is no. The best chess players in this world have the most average IQs compared to everybody else. Here's an experiment. If you compare masters to novices and you place a chessboard with pieces on them randomly and you ask them to look at it for a few seconds and recreate the board, novices are terrible. They get five, five pieces out of 25. And the experts, they get them all correct. Experts are really good. So if you do the experiment in a different way where you place the pieces that don't represent anything about chess, you move them upside down, backwards, you put them all over the place, then the experts equal the novices. In fact, when you do it again, the experts are worse than the novices because they're so confused about the pieces being in such awkwardly bad positions. The reason why chess players are so good and get them all right is because they have huge mental libraries. They've been through those positions so many times that they just recall the chunked position and not every individual piece. Inexperienced players use calculation. The masters use pattern recognition. Not that different than surgery. Inexperienced surgeons are calculating throughout the entire operation. Experienced surgeons know what's happening in a different way. Magnus Carlsen can play 10 games of chess without looking. He's blindfolded. He's got all 10 games going on in his mind. He doesn't even get to see the board. It's called blindfold chess. To me, this is completely amazing. Alexander Alakai, 1924, placed 26 blindfolded games in this country and the United States and in New York City, in fact. And if you think about how much material and information is going on, it's utterly ridiculous. This is how he developed this technique. In 1914, he's Russian, he's playing in Germany, war breaks out and he gets held hostage with all the other Russian players. And while they're held hostage, these chess players start playing chess with each other just by talking. e4, e5, knight f3, knight f6, bishop c4, and that's how they play without boards, and that's how he learned to do it. So grandmasters, in fact, see collections of chunked information interacting with other information. They see the board much different than the novice, and they can assess weaknesses and strengths. Why is chess so powerful for us? It's because as we develop our skill, we see much differently than, say, the novice. If you're a beginner or you're a novice, you don't want to make the moves like they do. 
You want to see like the expert, not be able to do like the expert. Hey, this kid's nine. He's playing what's called simul chess. He's not blindfolded. He's moving around. He's playing all these guys. These are all masters, not quite grandmasters yet. Look at this poor guy, master, losing his queen. This guy's trying to intimidate him. So these simul games are very popular. Bobby Fischer, playing 50 games in a row, usually does not lose a single game, and all of these players are talented. That seems incredible to me. I know the talent in this room, and if you've been to an OLC or a large cadaver course, many of us can't relate to playing simul chess, but all of us, I think, can go around the station. And if it's an ACL or if it's a shoulder instability case, we can walk to every station and say, hey, off here, move this here, do that, and go to the next one and come back and recall what was happening during that procedure. And that's because we have these mental libraries that we can draw off of. This ability to create chunked information is really understood at, the, at different levels. So this is my son, Brady. In school, he's asked to do exercises that teach about chunking. Make a pattern, call it artwork, and it's the pattern that's important. Here's something I find fascinating. If we think about surgical ability, we often think, how many times did he do it? If he's done it a bunch of times, he's probably good at it. How many chess games did you play? The best predictor of chess ability is not how much you play, it's actually how much time you analyze games. The best chess players analyze previous games, games of masters, games of grandmasters. That's how they spend their time, not just cranking out games in the park. And I think for many of us, the best surgeons spend more time analyzing surgeries, especially surgeries that don't go well. Okay, I'm going to talk about something else, and that has to do with excuses. We've all heard about people say, hey, anesthesia wasn't great today. It really hurt me in the operating room. The equipment wasn't available, all that kind of stuff. Happens in the athletic world, bad call, bad weather. This is the Intrepid, west side, 46th Street, live about 30 blocks south of this. South of this. I drive home and look at it every day. A lot of play dates on the Intrepid, so Charlie's been there a bunch of times. This is what's on the roof of the Intrepid, a bunch of jets. This is the F-4. The F-4 was the jet that was fighting against the Russian MiG in Vietnam, and it was the fastest jet of the time. Big guns, missiles that could target in all different ways. And the US was always proud about their kill ratio in previous wars. That is, for every jet they lost, they would take at least five or 10 of the opponents. But what happened against Vietnam is their ability to take down jets was poor. Even though it was better than, than Vietnamese, it was only two to one. In fact, it was so bad that the military stopped all air combat, moratorium. And during the time that they were stopped, two things happened. The Navy, with their jet training, started a new training principle. And the Air Force, yeah, they did the same thing. So the Navy did this fighter weapon school. What they did was during exercises of fighter uh, exercises, as soon as they were done, they would review videotape of that exercise and they would ask brutal questions. Why did you do that? What were you thinking at the time? Tell us what could have been done better. And because it was on video, there was no way to hide. And it was brutally honest. And as soon as they went through it and came up with better plans, they went back and got right back in the comp cockpit and did it again. And so after a year, the war resumed with the Air Force and with the Navy, and the Air Force actually got worse than even before this period of moratorium. But the Navy's ratio improved, and it improved dramatically. They went from 2 to 12 and a half, and that is an incredible amount of improvement over a one-year period. And so machines don't fight wars, people do, and they use your minds. It wasn't the jets, it was the pilots, and it was the training of the pilots. You guys know what this Navy fighter weapon school is. It became very popular in this movie. It's now informally known as Top Gun. Here's something amazing. If you're a pilot and it's wartime, and you win your first dogfight and survive, your chances of winning the next dogfight is dramatically better. And if you win the next one after that, it's even better. And in fact, if you win 20 dogfights in a row, your chances of being killed on 21st dogfight is essentially zero. 
That means the further you get with your real life training, the better you are. There's a huge cost to this. The cost of on the job training in the military is incredibly high, and that relates to us. The cost of on the job training for surgeons can be completely high. So, hey, if mistakes are unacceptably high, like in medicine, we have to do things in training that are different so that we don't have this tremendous learning curve. So now let's kind of dissect down what training is a little deeper. This is Dan Coyle, became a friend of mine as I worked through a book project, putting all this kind of material together. He wrote a fantastic book called The Talent Code. He's now a consultant for Major League Baseball teams and all kinds of organizations. And he says that talented people have a different relationship with practice than the people that are less talented. Atul Gawande, there's a great book. I give it to all my fellows. Indeed, the most important talent may be the talent for practice itself. What is practice? I studied engineering in college, mechanical engineering. Strain is you got material, you pull on it, and it changes length. That's strain. This is analogous to reaching and skill development, where you have to so-called stretch yourself. Now, let's contrast that to time. Many of us think that time's important. How many did you do? How long have you been doing it for? That's what patients want to know. How many of these operations did you do? Well, experience in isolation does not equal better performance. And John Wooden, who you all know, 10 NCAA championships, four years of not losing a game in collegiate basketball, one of the most heralded and studied coaches of our time, has said, never mistake activity for achievement. I cover about 80 baseball games a year. Often I drive from Connecticut to Yankee Stadium. And I put navigation on like all you guys do, and I make phone calls the whole way home, uh, all the way to the stadium. There was a day when my nav wasn't working. I pulled over, I hit the thing, I restarted the car, it wasn't working. I could not get to the stadium. I did not have to get there. It was before Waze and all that kind of stuff. So there is passivity in learning, just like there's passivity in driving. So if you're involved with residents and fellows, and they're in the case, and they're working through a total shoulder, they could have done 300 total shoulders, and if they're passive in the process, they didn't pick anything up. So time as experience may not be as important as that reaching component, which is strain times the amount of time you spend at it is really how you equate skill. And we should avoid this trap of years passing by where we're not stretching ourselves because it'll signify that we're not improving. So there's a comfort level. You all heard of this, get, uncom get comfortable with the uncomfortable. That means get outside your comfort zone and do things that you find that are hard. There are reaches. This is the amount of time you did it. How many cases did you do and things like that? There's ways to enhance your reaches. Brazil has amazing soccer players. In part, it's because of this. They play a game called futsal they get a huge amount of touches in a short period of time. The skill development going on in this type of environment is much more powerful than 11 versus 11. I played college uh, soccer here at Columbia, and when I was a kid, we developed by playing in the backyard. We just played backyard, three on three all day long. And now we have a lot of 11 on 11 games with our youth athletes. Look at how much more touches you get on the ball. That's how you develop the skill for when you can get to the higher level. So it's amount of reps. We can figure out how to get reps in surgery. We've got all kinds of simulators and things like that. I'd be happy to take questions about that. But here's something that I think is underutilized, and this is feedback. In the loop of practice and getting better, you have to do it. You have to get feedback. Then you have to make a correction, and then you do it again. How do we get feedback? Well, picture a guy bowling, and he's got a curtain in front of his eyes. He has no feedback. How is he going to improve his bowling? Or you're cooking, and you never get to taste your food. Or if you do scoliosis surgery, and you never get to look at your x-rays and see what your correction was like afterwards. Immediate feedback is the best feedback in general. So musicians listen while they play. And dancers don't dance in front of a wall. They dance in front of a mirror, critiquing their moves. And for us, as we develop as surgeons, the younger we are, the more we get feedback. Or in training, we get feedback. But once we're in our profession, we don't get feedback. And the higher up we get, the more people do not want to give us feedback. Here's one way that I do it. I grade every operation I do. Give it a letter grade, B minus today. 
pretty harsh grader too. If you give yourself a grade, it's forcing you to be self-critical. This term is called metacognition, the ability to be self-critical or self-observe. And this, I believe, is true. The highest level performers, they have this ability better than others and they use it more than others. That's true in sports. Randy Posh, if you've ever seen his lecture, it's really powerful. You can Google it and you see it on YouTube. The best gift an educator can give is to give someone the ability to be self-reflective. And in fact, this process of self-awareness is becoming a big notion in business. It's written about in books. If you're going to hire somebody, yeah, he's talented, good hands, good everything. You know what they care about now? Are they self-reflective? Because that's going to tell them how high they're going to go, how much they're going to improve. This is my daughter. I showed you Charlie. I'm going to show all the kids because I've learned something as a parent quality, she will not go to bed at night until she's had her time with her yearbook. Then you got to pull it away from her and then she can go to bed. This is her yearbook. I took it away from her so she can go to bed. I thought at fourth grade this was pretty powerful even though we've all heard it. You give somebody a fish, you can feed them for the day, but if you teach them how to fish, you can feed them forever. This is our ability when we train residents to give them the ability to give themselves feedback. Here's something that is a uh, very interesting in our field. It has to do with ego. Medical error is one of the top causes of death in this country. It's considered number three, depending on how you analyze it. And the numbers are staggering. This is a great book, Why We Make Mistakes. And here's some research that compares operating rooms to cockpits. And the operating room has hierarchy. You've got a surgeon, you've got anesthesiologists, and you've got staff. But in the cockpit, which used to have hierarchy, which they changed, it no longer has hierarchy to the same degree. And in a survey of thousands of pilots and doctors, this question was asked. Should junior staff question senior staff? Take hey, a look at this. 97% of airline pilots say yes. But only 55% of surgeons say it's acceptable for junior staff to question senior staff. How about fatigue? I perform effectively during critical times. Yeah, the pilots say, you know what? I don't think so. Surgeons, yeah, of course, I can perform no matter what. Okay, here's the thing about radiologists. Incorrect with interpreting films. The ones that think that they're right with the most confidence are the ones that are wrong most often. Jerome Brookman, he was a uh, medical student at Columbia and wrote this book, How Doctors Think. So we were uh, fortunate enough to win the World Series in 2009 and this is the president now of our hospital. He gave me a call and said, hey, I run this pep rally for the hospital, all the administration. It's usually about 600 people, all the division chiefs and everybody. We'd love to have the manager of the Yankees come and speak. So he asked me if I can get Joe Girardi to come and give some advice to our physicians and our leadership of the hospital. And after he was done speaking, gave great anecdotes about how medicine affects him, he got this question from the audience, raised their hand and said, hey Joe, can you give us advice on leading groups of physicians for better performance? You won the World Series, how do we get better? This is what he said, you and we have teams of all-stars, much like the staff of your hospital, and to get the players to work toward the goal of the team and win a championship, every player must leave his ego at the entrance of the stadium. Ego is the biggest obstacle to team performance when you have so much talent. This is something that's been uh, very powerful for me, and I bet all of you do it in some way or another. And this is how you use what is referred to as cognitive rehearsal to get better. If you practice with your fingers, you need all day, but if you practice with your mind, you need a half hour. This is coming from one of the most notable instructors of violin. The greatest displays in surgery are created twice. First in your mind, where you plan it out, and you visualize it, and then it happens in the operating room. So golfers like Jack Nicholas has said he's never taken a swing that he hasn't visualized. And some of the more abstract things like music can also happen in your mind first where you can solve musical problems just using your mind. This is Charlie Wilson. He's a neurosurgeon in San Francisco, now retired. He pioneered this transphenoidal pituitary surgery, really breakthrough. Uh, in his field. And he said that he visualized every operation he ever did when he ran in the morning 
And when he did the actual operation, it was easy because it was like he was doing it for the second time. And in fact, the research on visualization says that if you close your eyes and visualize, your brain activity is almost the same as if you're physically doing it. And the more you mentally rehearse, the more these neural pathways become prominent. In fact, you make more myelin. It's all like biologic now. You can study it. And if you do a meta-analysis on this, if you do a meta-analysis on throwing a dart or playing a violin and you do mental rehearsal, you can get two-thirds of what the physical practice is. And this is important for fields like the military. It's important for our field where there's consequences to practice. U.S. Army Special Forces, either Green Berets, weeks of training for a single mission, and the day of the mission, they do two-part training. Every mistake is thought of ahead of time, and they create appropriate responses, and this is that counterfactual simulation. This is the pre-mortem. Let's think about what could go wrong first. Then they take a break for lunch. They think about it all going perfectly, and then they execute. And many top performers do this, whether it's football, soccer, basketball, and the Olympians that we all know are training like crazy. They use mental rehearsal more than anybody else to get better. I'm going to talk about a few things that uh, relate back to this concept of chunking on how we see the most gifted and magical performances that we don't know how to explain. This is a book by Malcolm Gladwell. It's called Blink. This is a statue. This statue is being offered to a Getty Museum in LA. Six million dollars. Authentic. 600 BC Greek Roman statue and it's authentic. They tested. They took a year of testing before they dropped the six million on this. Analyzed the material, the ceramic, it's old. So after they buy the thing, they showcase it, they put it in the museum. The first expert to walk in took a look at it and said, you got a fake. Then they brought in a second expert and he looked at it and said, you have a fake. And when they asked him, please help us understand how it's a fake, we did a year of testing and said, I don't understand. I, I'm telling you it's a fake. I can't even tell you why. They just have a sense that it's not right. You see this salon of athletes? It's Andrea Pirlo, plays with New York City Football Club. Unbelievable. This guy looks like there's going to be a problem where he's going to lose the ball and we're going to eat a goal and be down one nothing. Instead, he doesn't lose the ball. All of a sudden, it's a goal-scoring chance, and it's unbelievable how these things happen. This is a Google of the greatest plays in Yankee history. And the history. It's been over 100 years of this game played. There's about 300 pitches in each game. I did a, a little simple math. This is about 5 million plays. I'm going to show you number eight of close to five million. It's probably more than doesn't that. have a stolen base the entire season, so you're not going to run. It's 2001. You got to wait. For Mike Machina gap. pitching. That is fair down the right field line. Giambi on his way to third, and they're going to wave him around. The throw misses a cutoff man. Shot into the plate. Out of the plate. How is this? How is this such an important play? I'm going to tell you. Jeremy Jambi running from uh, first, trying to make a play at home. The doesn't have a stolen base the entire season, so you're not going to run. You're not going to hit the right. You got to wait for a gapper. That is fair. Shane the Spencer right gets the ball. Giambi on his throw at home. And they're going to wave him around. He overthrows the two is a cutoff cutoff people. Derek Jeter with one of the and most Derek Jeter plays shortstop. He goes from shortstop, shortstop Both to the dugout, Jeter coming down gets the, the ball line, and flips it and gets him out. Hand, a shovel to Posada, and Giambi is out. What an unbelievable play by Jeter. The reason why this is the best play in our number eight in Yankee history is because he doesn't. he's not supposed to be there. He wasn't supposed to be in that position. And when does that ball ever get overthrown? If you ask him why you did that, hey, Jeter, why'd you go over there and do that flip? He's like, I don't know. This is the way that firefighters who are in a building and say, it's time to get out. And then you get out, and then the floor collapses, and everybody would have died. It's this game sense. It's playing unconscious. And Josh Waitzkin, big chess player in New York City, uh, scholastic champion for 10 years, said the intuition is the portal between the unconscious and the conscious mind. And what happens is when you practice, it becomes automatic, and you think about it, and it becomes even better, and it becomes something that becomes so automatic that you then have more brain capacity to be creative. 
And what distinguishes a great bridge player, a great surgeon, from the rest is how much they have on automatic. And so Tony Dungy said, champions don't do extraordinary things. They do the ordinary things, but they do them so well and they can do them so fast. So we obsess over the fundamentals in surgery. I obsess over the fundamentals, much like this Coach Wooden that we talked about. His first practice with his incredible career is teaching guys how to put socks on annoys the players. For me, it's about draping. If a guy can't learn how to drape properly, how's he gonna learn how to do everything else involved in surgery? You get fundamentals down, you know you're gonna be on automatic and you're gonna get really good. So chunking gone right creates creativity and this can be physical genius. And when you think about it in tennis, novices watch the ball, but the experts watch the racket and some of the best players, they watch the body movement and they look at the whole movement and that's how they know where a 140 mile an hour serve is gonna go. This is a great story. This is Jenny Finch, one of the most accomplished softball uh, pitchers of our time, Olympic athlete, University of Arizona. She says, hey Al, how about I pitch to you? How about we do it in public, make it a contest? How about we film it? Three pitches, that's all I need. He says, you're crazy, big fat ball, I'll take you out. Three pitches, he strikes out. And it was actually Alex Rodriguez, supposed to be next. And he said, I declined. I just twisted my ankle. So the reason is they have so much automatic chunked information on a normal pitch that's overhand, they could not respond to this underhand pitch. It's only coming in at 60 miles an hour. So they're not able to hit it. I'm going to talk about coaching, and then I'm going to finish up real quick. So as teachers, many of us in this room were teachers. It is so, we're in such a privileged position because um, we affect eternity in some ways, it could be argued, the way that we influence people. I was asked to write an article about coaching. And sometimes we feel like coaching, if you have a coach, it's a sign of weakness. And so I asked this question, if you were a patient, this is in a leadership uh, magazine, would you want your patients to know if you were a surgeon that you actually had a coach? So I argued some points there and then Really what coaches do is they see you the ways that you can't see yourselves and they can give you feedback. Atul Gawande invited a coach into his OR and got great feedback and it changed the way that he operated. Would you please tell me which way I ought to go from here, said Alice. Well, that depends a great deal on where you want to go, said the cat. I don't care much where, said Alice. Then it doesn't matter which way you go, does it, said the cat. This is from Alice in uh, Wonderland. The, the reason why this is powerful and I share it with you is because if we don't know where we're directing people, if we don't know where the ship's going, if we don't have goals and objectives, all of this skill work and all of this practice is not gonna be as powerful and effective. We have to start helping Alice with deciding where she wants to go. I'm gonna speak about choking because I find this fascinating and uh, I get a lot of questions about it because we spoke about skill, but really we're performers and we have to perform well. Hey, if you had one shot, one opportunity to seize everything you ever wanted, one moment, would you capture it or just let it slip? You guys know who said this? This is Eminem. This guy, in fact, won the Oscar for this song in the movie Eight Mile. He refused to play it at the Oscars. The only time the winning song was not performed because he didn't want to dial down the make it PG th uh, rated. And so they wouldn't let him sing it. He wouldn't change it. In fact, he is a great musician. Spotify has ranked him as the most streamed artist um, of all time on Spotify. So uh, I do some skiing. This is a famous shoot called Corbett's Coolor in Jackson Hole. And this is a my skis. That's the shoot. It's actually much worse than what it looks like right here. So. You can see how deserted it is. It's not like there's people lined up or people waving you on like, go ahead, it's drop in. Well, this is what Phil Jackson said. In a close game, you check your pulse, and if it gets over 100, it's going to affect my thinking. I checked my pulse. It was about a buck 50, so I said it wasn't, it wasn't time just yet. But what happens in choking, and you drop in, and you get stiff and rigid, and you don't make turns. You have to make two quick turns. If you don't, you hit this rock over here, and it's the highest uh, concentration of femur fractures in the state from this rock right here. And 
uh, you, don't make, you don't execute and you don't perform. And choking is about not performing well because you have a emotional response to the physical activity. That's really panic. And panic can be differentiated from choking. Choking is about thinking too much. We talked about things becoming automatic. If it's automatic, like a free throw, and then you start deconstructing it to say, I'm going to really concentrate and I'm going to use my hand. And then you start to deconstruct it and then you get into trouble. So Dan Coyle says the best performers deal with coaching by recreating high intense situations and they simulate it beforehand. And you can create pre-shot routines to improve your performance. And if you get distracted, the guy's clanking his chain and you're changing his pocket and you're a golfer, the guy will stop and step back and he'll redo his pre-shot routine. I, in fact, at least once a month when I'm about to start an operation say, I'm going to be back in five minutes because the nurse doesn't have the equipment. There's some commotion going on on the other side of the table. I don't recognize somebody in the room and it doesn't look right. So. The most uh, common phone call I get from a fellow who's in practice says, I have this bad complication, can you help me? I like this rule. The first rule of holds is when you find yourself in a hole, the first rule is to stop digging. So if something bad's happening in the operating room or in life, sometimes we try to quickly get a quick solution and it actually compounds the problem. It happens in the operating room frequently. First thing to do is recognize that you are having a problem and don't take the shortcut out that could cause an even bigger problem. And I think this is true of surgeons. The greatest and toughest art in golf is playing badly well and all the greats have been masters at it. I think you all know my wife's a surgeon here, Beth Schubenstein, and she'll ask me like I'm sure when you get home, hey, how was your day? Uh, really tough. Oh, I was tough. I had things that just didn't, rough. I had, and, well, had the case come out? Uh, it came out okay. So we have to do. When there's adversity, we still have to get a result that is going to help the patient. And performance is part mental. These are mental skills. So 90% of surgery may be half mental. This is my book, and the summary is that if you really want to get to a higher level and you want to do it like all the other people in other fields have done, it means you got to put in the hard work. That's how it gets done. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Chris. That was that was a great talk, and really appreciate you coming here. Um, I guess we have a few minutes if we want to open up for questions for Chris. Chris, are you how are you in, uh, integrating this into the education of the residents? <clears throat> are you trying to integrate these pr principles with the residency and fellow training? Yeah, this is a terrific question. So we have so much pressure on training right now. Work hour restrictions, the amount of surgical technique that we have to teach our residents from arthroscopy to minimally invasive spine surgery, it's really challenging. And more and more residents are doing fellowships and two fellowships and three fellowships. So uh, there are a few things that we do. One is you heard a little bit about our conference work and things like that, but something that's been innovative is that we have our residents now mentally rehearse surgery. And I'll give you an example. For an ACL reconstruction, I have a view medi on ACL surgery. Every one of the residents on my service does a mental rehearsal by watching the video, then closing their eyes, and they rehearse the surgery. And in fact, we've looked at the impact of how that can help them as a resident. And so there's certain things about how we can take advantage of the lab and time on their own and mental rehearsal without having to do it all in the operating room. And I could explain a little bit more about that. But the other comment I have is many of our young staff, it used to be that you would just let them run. Finish their fellowship, September 1st they start, and they just start operating. I spend more time with, um, with new staff than I ever have. And I've taken the top gun approach, and that is I film a young staff member doing a surgery, like an ACL or an instability surgery, and I review the film with them, and I'll say something like, it took 30 minutes to harvest the graft. And they say, no, it did, and I had it out in 10 minutes. And then I'm like, click up the tape, and that is one of the most powerful ways to learn when it's on video. So basically, it's perform and then review the performance, and then you can make changes that really get you to another level. Chris, great talk. Let me expect that from us. <laughs> um, two things. One is, um, you know, and I'm sure you know this, there's been a couple of studies looking at the success of the surgeon in America. One that's 
seems to come out the highest in a lot of studies is having to pay the large and support the college. It embodies all the things that you talk about in your thing. And the simulation, if you take care of Jeter doing that flip, he'll do it in another situation too once he comes up to speed because he's learned that skill in one in one set that he can transfer into the old one. But the other thing I think is important to hear you comment on is flexibility in coaching. You can't coach everybody the same way. Like for instance, if your preparation works for you, you had the Fosbury flop, if someone tried to get him to do it the traditional way, he never would have become a famous jumper. So the point is, I think one of the things we have to do is find out when we're mentoring and coaching, what works best for that particular area. And I think to become too formulaic in that, trying to say, okay, do it my way, is not necessarily always the best. For instance, when I have a resident fellow in the opera, I say, look, first time you're gonna watch me do it, so you're gonna see it can succeed the way I do it. But if you come in and just do it your way, I mean, try to do it my way, you've never even seen it, you're gonna say, this is no good. But once you learn my way, then do it whatever way you want. And I just think that's an important point that we as surgeons need to understand is that you can't coach everybody yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Coaching, leadership, leadership styles are different. Some people lead with authority. Some people lead with a different style of pace setting. There's all kinds of things about being a different leader. And every situation requires different leadership skills. Same with coaching. Some residents, their biggest issue is that they have a lack of confidence. You have to build confidence. Some people have a lack of skill. So you have to build up skill. And the different methods on how to do it I think it should be, as Steve said, should be tremendously appreciated. Now, we only have so much time to train residents and we're clever and then hopefully th when a resident goes through the whole process, they've had a number of experience and they learn what they respond to as their own personal growth, much like an athlete is, and then they learn how to learn for the rest of their career. I think that's the big take home point is that as a educator, we can help them, but as a somebody who wants to learn, you have to take responsibility and figure out how you learn as well and then emulate some of the people that you respond to and use their techniques on how they improve continuously. So we, every, every year there's a new technique for us to learn or every few years. In fact, there was, when I was a resident, there was no such thing as an arthroscopic slap repair and there are many people in this room who did open ACL surgeries. So our ability to learn and how we appreciate our learning will be powerful, and that's part of our training. Frank? Chris, great talk, as always. You know, I, I was reminded by some of these, uh, about some of these issues last weekend during the British Open, uh, and there, on the third day of the, 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 the Open, Saturday, Phil Mickelson had sort of a bad round, and the announcers were quick to report that after the round, he went to the driving range it was about 48 degrees, you know, the west coast of Scotland. It was getting dark, and he went out and hit balls for a long time. And it reminded me of something Jim Esch used to say when he introduced his shoulder course in San Diego every year. He'd say, you know, when professional golfers finish a round, they go to the driving range and they practice. When surgeons finish a busy day in the OR, they go to the golf course. And it, it just brings back some of these, these same issues that you've repeated here. Yeah. The when it comes to coaching and, it and for us to be self-reflective, one of the biggest obstacles we have is um, it's hard to admit that we didn't do a good job that day and that there was room for improvement in that particular situation. And even if we have that appreciation, we are not, we call it practice, we practice medicine, but we rarely practice because we're working. So we get done in the operating room at nine o'clock. Golfers, in fact, play a tournament on the weekends. They have all week to practice. We don't have scheduled practice time. And musicians, they have scheduled time to practice. We don't create scheduled time for practice. Yeah, we go to meetings and, in fact, lectures when it's studied. Lectures are probably the worst teaching environment out of any teaching you, uh, tool that we have. So I think your point is, Golfers know how to practice, know how to groove their swing. If it's off, I think if we're off on a surgery, we need to get better at designing time and methods how to groove our surgery better if it's off. Yeah, Bob. 
Chris, I, I love the talk, but uh, sort of like when you read the book and then see the movie, I encourage everyone to read the book because it's fantastic. <laughs> love the book, especially our residents. Uh, and I wish I had it when I was a resident. I tell them because it would have saved me years that I wasn't learning as much as I could have. Uh, anyway, my question is, um, with respect, I heard your answers to uh, Brian and Steve and Frank's questions, but uh, do you do anything different in the operating room? At the end of the day, surg the surgical residents have to learn how to do the procedure. We've got to teach them in the operating room to a degree. Uh, do you do anything different during the operation uh, over the last uh, 10 years while you've thought about this? Yeah, that, uh, that's a great question. So um, I'll share with you this. It used to be, hey, this is how you make the portal. It's got to be right here. And this is how you make the incision. And this is where the retractors go. And then I would ask them a question, what's the next move in this operation? And if they didn't know the next move because they were passive, they weren't, they weren't engaged, then I'd say, okay, I'm taking over. My question that I ask a resident or fellow right now that is extremely uncomfortable is I'll stop operating and I'll say, what are you thinking about right now? I mean, they are tortured by this question. <laughs> This is so open-ended. The reason is part of that, what I was saying, if you want to see like a better surgeon, you want to know what they're thinking about. And so the discrepancy on what they're thinking and what I'm thinking, I want to bring closer together. So sometimes they're thinking, hey, what brace is this guy going to need? Because I got, you know, they're working a checklist in their mind. I, I got to put this, I got to order the brace. I can't forget to order the brace because this might be a special brace. But if I ask somebody what they're thinking about and they're saying, I'm thinking this dissection on the subscap is so complicated that I would be getting a hand surgeon ready because the axillary nerve is in jeopardy. If a fellow ever said that to me, one, I would say, call up the hand surgeon. This is the greatest, uh, I'm going to take that advice. So, but if they're saying things like, um, I, I, they're not thinking about anything. So the, the process for me has not been, let me show them. And Charlie actually told, uh, taught me this quote, uh, this quote. You show them, they don't learn. You teach them, they remember. But if you involve them, they learn. So involve them in the surgery rather than just showing them and having them execute steps. And that is, what are you thinking about? The hard part is during an operation, you can't spend a lot of time having a 20 minute discussion. So that's why we often have this case conference or this surgical conference to go through it and then we can flesh out so many of these little details. Thank you very much, Chris. That was an incredible talk. I really appreciate you coming here. Um, I just had one last announcement. Was uh, They asked me to remind everybody that the application for research funding for, from the Surgeon Chief Fund, um, is the deadline is August 15th. So if you guys have projects that you wanted to try to get some uh, funding through the Surgeon Chief Fund, you have to get the applications into Todd uh, by the middle of August. Thanks, everyone, for coming.